Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yep. My, okay, I'm here. Okay. Good afternoon and uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the second in a series of Front Porch Conversations. Uh, in another lifetime, we might even have rocking chairs. Um, <laughs> but this, uh, this is a series of conversations co-sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institution, where my co-host Brent Orell and I are engaging in conversation with authors of recent research on rural America and its implications for po public policy, as well as the health and well-being of our nation. So our guests today are Catherine Eden and Timothy Nelson, co-authors, along with Luke Schaefer, who unfortunately couldn't join us, uh, of The Injustice of Place, Uncovering the Legacy of Poverty in America, which was published at the end of the summer last year. But before I go too far with introductions and get us into the conversation, I want to go over a few housekeeping notes. So as I mentioned, this is the second in a series. Uh, you can find a link to the recording of our first conversation that Brent and I had with Nick Jacobs of The Rural Voter on AEI's website, as well as the website of the Reimagining Rural Policy Initiative that I lead here at the Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institution. And you'll also be able to find registration for our future Front Porch Conversations there, and even catch up on my podcast, Reimagine Rural. First season is already out, and a second season's forthcoming, uh, which captures stories from local leaders uh, in rural towns across America. Um, just to let you know what we do have upcoming uh, on the front porch, on March 14th at 4 p.m., we'll have Carol Graham, who is a colleague here at Brookings and the author of The Power of Hope, How the Science of Well-Being Can Save Us from Despair, and that will be hosted by AEI. On April 4th at uh, 10 a.m., we'll host Elizabeth Curd Halkett, who's the author of The Overlooked Americans, The Resilience of Our Rural Towns and What It Means for Our Country. And that will be hosted back here at Brookings. Um, uh, interesting note, uh, we didn't know each other, but Elizabeth and I grew up in small towns in rural central Pennsylvania, about 10 minutes from each other. Um, and then on May 3rd at 1 p.m. we'll be with Stephen Kahn, who is the author of Lies of the Land, Seeing Rural America for What It Is and What It Isn't, and that will be hosted by AEI. So a great lineup uh, in the coming weeks and months, and it will give us a real opportunity to examine the long-term demographic, economic, technological, and social factors that have influenced rural America and focus on the policy implications, which I think will be a welcome change from all the chatter about rural politics that I expect we'll be experiencing this year. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be doing this in partnership with Brent, uh, who is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a real expert on workforce development and job training, really work as vocation, mm -hmm. uh, as well as criminal justice reform Brent has a long history of public service in both the legislative and executive branches. And he also hosts a podcast called Hardly Working, which I highly commend to you. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by our guests today, Kathy Eden and Tim Nelson. Uh, Kathy is the William Church Osborne Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University, where she serves as the director of the Center on Research and Child Wellbeing. She's well known for her groundbreaking research on poverty in America, and the hallmark of her research is a sort of a direct, in-depth observations of the lives of low-income Americans. Um, Tim is the Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Sociology and a lecturer in Sociology and Public Policy at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, and has had a particular research in interest in low-income fa fathers. So we're looking forward to kind of a free-flowing, informal, but well-informed conversation. And after a conversation among ourselves, uh, we're going to invite your participation, you who are in person with us uh, in the audience, as well as online. And if you're online, you can pose a question to events at brookings.edu or on X, the social media formerly known as Twitter. 
uh, at Brookings Global using the hashtag on the front porch. And Brent, I'm going to turn it over to you to get our conversation started. Very good. Uh, and both of you, welcome to the porch. Thank you. Um, yeah. And uh, these, are, uh, these conversations are intended to be very exploratory in nature, you know, really trying to step back from the, some of the pressures and tensions of the moment mm. to really reflect on how we got to where we are uh, and what we need to do next. So, uh, you know, I was, I was reflecting on um, the title of the book, The Injustice of Place, and I think we could devote a pretty long conversation just to that title, mm -hmm. because I think it's very provocative. Um, uh, but and and I think we're going to get there today. So, but first, just again, step back. How did you how did you get to this topic? Uh, what was the inspiration for the book? Uh, tell us a little bit about how you went about. We don't want to. We got a lot of uh, policy nerds uh, here and online. I'm sure that would be fascinated to know all about, you know, the the methods, uh, and they can read about that in the book. Um, Very so, nice appendix. Yeah. <laughs> so let's um, instead kind of focus on the inspiration and then give us the headlines of of what you what you found. So. Um... A couple of years ago, Luke Schaefer, our third co-author, and I wrote a book called Two Dollars a Day, which was really about America's most disadvantaged people. And uh, in the aftermath of that book, um, I guess it was an email we received from a program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And believe me, if you're a researcher, you know this never happens. <laughs> they, they, they don't call you, right? You have to call them. And she said, uh, would you be interested in partnering with us and turning your gaze from America's poorest people to America's poorest places with an eye toward health? And uh, right away, uh, we thought this was a great idea. Um, we'd been um, d just really struck, I think, by our field work for $2 a day on how powerful uh, the context that people uh, we followed, uh, how powerful they were in their lives. Um, research had been showing that place, especially the work of uh, Opportunity Insights, place had a tremendous impact where you grow up on how you do, um, in, in, at least in the early life course, uh, maybe more so than uh, the common factors we think of in predicting life chances. And so we said yes. Now, I won't say much about measurement because there is a very good appendix, but the first thing you have to do when you take on something like this is you have to figure out how do you measure America's most disadvantaged places? So, um, you know, we knew that we didn't want to stick with just income. Um, you know, the poverty line had been developed many, many years prior. Uh, it was very useful for, for predicting hardship. Um, but we, we had this huge data infrastructure, and we wanted to measure poverty more holistically. So we chose uh, to stick with the poverty measures, both poverty and deep poverty, which, as you know, is... Uh, the number of percentage of families living uh, below half the poverty line. But we added two measures of health, um, which is sort of a cumulative measure of poverty, right? Um, because even though you may no longer be poor, poverty uh, often gets under the skin and continues to affect your life chances, so low birth weight and, and life expectancy. And then um, finally, a measure of, of the, the opportunity structure in a place. So we included the Chetty Mobility metrics uh, that, that measure how likely it is a child uh, raised to the 25th percentile of the income distribution will rise uh, to the middle class or beyond. And uh, we used machine learning to, you know, to weight these because there was no other way uh, to weight them. And then we plotted every county because if you want to include rural America, uh, you've got to talk about counties and uh, the 500 largest cities in the United States. And here's what we found. It's going to be yeah, so if we behind can, me. If we can put the map up um, and, and just sort of show what the outcome of, the, of those calculations were. So, Tim, yes. you and I and Luke <laughs> have spent our whole career studying urban poverty. Uh, well, how did you feel when you saw this map? 
Well, the, the patterns are just really striking. And some, you know, are, are expected, I guess. There's Appalachia there. Uh, we had, I'd gone with you um, to the Mississippi Delta region for $2 a day sort of field work. Um, and that, so that whole Delta region really stands out. And across um, all of those southern states uh, up into the, the Carolinas, one thing that I had no awareness of was the South Texas um, and how that would show up. Um, so there were, there were some sort of not surprising things, although very striking when you actually see it kind of laid out like that, um, and then some, uh, some more surprising things. Yeah, and I should mention that the other, um, many of the other west of the Mississippi locations are, are Native nations and uh, that have been you know, historically uh, exploited for generations. So what did, what did we do next? We sent uh, graduate students uh, to live in these places for months, sometimes years. We ourselves Well, first we selected... Oh, we selected some sites. Some right. sites within the larger regional clusters. So we were in Greenwood, Mississippi, um, which is in the Delta. We were in uh, Manchester, Kentucky, in Clay County, in the eastern Kentucky. We were in Marion, South Carolina, part of the old tobacco uh, belt region, um, close to the North Carolina border. And we were in um, Crystal City, Texas, in Zavala County, in what I guess used to be known as the Winter Garden area, southwest of San Antonio. Yeah. And so uh, we began visiting these places, and then the pandemic hit. And so we uh, hit the history books. Uh, because right about this time, when we were all in the field, one of our graduate students, Brian Parsons, sent us a map of the rate of enslavement in 1860, and um, he, he juxtaposed it to our map, the one you see here. And the very gradations of uh, the rate of enslaved persons in 1860 and our map today, the very gradations were the same. Hmm. And this was such a striking phenomenon uh, that we decided we had to learn the history of these places. So, uh, so the book is really about, uh, so all of these places have a deep um, history of human exploitation not seen elsewhere in the United States and deep resource extraction. They were all built on single commodity um, uh, economies, so cotton, tobacco, vegetables in Texas, timber and then coal in, uh, in Appalachia. So these regions were founded on very unequal, a few people at the top who controlled everything, the economy, the political structure, everything. And they needed, for all these kinds of commodities, you needed vast amounts of labor. Um, and so that's, that was kind of the founding story of these places. Um, was. Uh, and, and because of the need for cheap, controllable labor, there were lots of labor and social controls put on them. The most, of course, um, extreme being slavery in the American South. Uh, but even if you think about in Appalachia, the, the, the company towns and all those uh, kinds of apparatus that really are controlling the, the laboring population. Yeah. So the book is really about... Um the continuity between the most disadvantaged regions in America today and their pasts. And what we use the ethnography for is to try to identify the mechanisms. What's going on in these places? Why is it uh, that we could have predicted where these places would be by knowing a few things about their economic and labor relations? Uh, maybe 100, 120, uh, maybe in some cases 200 years uh, prior. and. Um, if we could figure out what those mechanisms were, maybe we could find, identify novel pol policy solution that, that are, you know, they kind of get beyond the one size fits all. Uh, many times those policies are made with urban America in mind, but what, what, what could we do for these places uh, based on these mechanisms and what might we come up with that was really new? Could we put the map up again for just a second? Um, I'd like to just follow up on something. So you point out that um, Appalachia is one of these areas of, but of course, uh, sort of formal slavery was pretty rare in much of Appalachia. I'm sure there was slavery in Appalachia, but particularly in the northern end of Appalachia, right. you wouldn't have seen uh, 
uh, much slavery. So I'm curious. It, so what, a, a, uh, you talked corrective. about company town yeah. effect. Right. Um, uh, that if you work for the mine and right. bought all of your stuff from the mine and you owed your on credit to the mine. Right. And if you tried to organize a union, you and your family were out. <laughs> so, um, and in South Texas, um, yeah, so the map, Kathy talked about of, of enslaved people, of course, didn't include Texas or Appalachia. That was just more the Cotton Belt uh, Delta area. But of course, in South Texas, that was a largely ranching, very depopulated region until after the, um, you know, the treaty that made that part of the United States. Um, but it really transitioned very quickly from um, a more paternalistic type of control to um, these, the, the new um, agricultural owners coming in, often from other parts of the country, as they built railroads and stuff to bring them in there in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and, and vast amounts of uh, Mexican migration labor coming in over the border. Um, and so there was very exploitative... Um, labor controls established in South Texas to keep people um, kind of available during especially the harvest and, and the planting time. Yeah, one, uh, one activist from South Texas called, called the region um, Jim Crow with a sombrero. Huh. So many of the labor controls that were practiced during the and age of tenant farming. Educational segregation and... Lack uh, of suffrage. Uh, Texas had a primary. white primary. Yeah, the, all those... So, so you talk, um, as you look at that history and also do the interviews, you did a lot of qualitative, and as you said, you had graduate students living in those places, you picked some places as well. Um, in the book, you come to a set of drivers. Like, talk to us about what are, the, what are the things that you found that you feel like is continuing to reinforce this disadvantage? So this is a book of surprises, uh, except for one of the... One of the drivers we identify, I would never have thought that we would be writing a book about these topics. And the, the more f familiar topic is the separate and highly unequal schools, although the extent of that in these places is, you know, we, we, we write a lot about segregation academies uh, that were stood up uh, um, in, as um, Brown uh, started to get actually enforced in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, and uh, the, the denial of basically a high school education uh, to children on, you know, in the have-nots in all of these regions. So that was, the, that was sort of the expected one, although we didn't expect the extent. I had never heard of segregation academies before. You know, Kamala Harris uh, went to school in Orangeburg, South Carolina, in one of these schools, as did uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith. Uh, but the le less familiar ones uh, were, uh, first, um, violence. I never thought of rural America as being violent, but when we look at the data, these are some of the violent, most violent places in the United States. And uh, in, in, so that was, that's one of the drivers. And in fact, um, you know, LaFour La County, Mississippi is as violent as Chicago. So it's really hard to get your, your head around that. Uh, corruption is another one. Each of these regions had a deep and abiding history of corruption. Uh, and in eastern Kentucky, where um, th they did uh, um, mine salt in the early 1800s uh, with enslaved labor, um, so there, there was slavery in that part of uh, central Appalachia. Um, you know, there was just uh, an incredible, the, the way you kept these economies going and the way you suppressed labor created deeply corrupt path. And then as the, as the uh, economies turned over, right, the way you maintain control is by uh, fleecing the public purse. And so we tell, you know, these are some of the most corrupt. Uh, we have very bad data on corruption, it turns out, but these are some of the mm. most corrupt places in the nation. Just, but if you've heard of the Brett Favre sort of Mississippi welfare scandal, that actually started in Greenwood. Well, in that with county, a Greenwood, yeah, Greenwood with a nonprofit. Yeah. yeah. So it's the uh, largest public scandal in Mississippi history of $80 million of TANIT funds um, being misdirected. Um, but, but then uh, going beyond that, we um, identified uh, this corruption, uh, the often the um, systematic racism embedded in government policy 
uh, which often in the face of a natural disaster, and all of these areas are more prone to natural disasters, um, actually exacerbates rather than decreases inequality. Uh, you write, Tim, about, um, about backlash. Each of these places were, were the cradles of civil rights across American history. I learned, um, yeah, it was great. I, I was more the history person, um, so I got to go down some very interesting rabbit holes. But uh, I never heard about, for example, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union started in Arkansas during the Depression really as a protest against some of the government's agricultural policies where the money was going to the plantation owners and they were just trusted to give it out to their tenants. Well, you can imagine that didn't work out so well. So there was a whole uh, interracial, which was extremely rare at the time, um, union that was formed across the South uh, for yeah. higher wages and so on. But in each of these, and we could talk about the, some of the civil rights epicenters are in these very places. Uh, Selma, Alabama, for example. Um, but in each of these places, and then in the Appalachia, the Union movements, um, there was there was tremendous retribution from local elites who controlled the local law enforcement and all the employers and so on. And even to this day, although we've all you know we have the civil rights we do because of these places, uh, but these places have often been left out. They've gotten bad raps. You know, uh, the Winter Garden was referred to by the, by the governor of Texas as Little Cuba uh, because of the activism there. And so even today, these places bear the scars of their civil rights activism. Mm -hmm. Now, the one that I was most taken with um, was uh, this theme of social infrastructure. And uh, so we went to Clay County, Kentucky, and we were... <laughs> We picked these places based on the numbers, so we didn't know anything about them. And indeed, we kind of blinded ourselves to like news stories about these places. Uh, but when we got down there, it was obvious that Clay County was the epicenter of the opioid epidemic. Literally, 251 prescriptions uh, for every hundred um, for every hundred men, women, and children in the county. You know, in, in the in the height of the epidemic, and still about 130 today. And um, lots of people were dying, um, overdosing, and, and everybody had a diagnosis for this problem. They'd say, well, you know, there's nothing to do here but drugs. Uh, but drugs. That's what the young people turned to drugs, because there's nothing to do. And we were like, oh, please. <laughs> I literally remember dismissing this discourse at a team meeting. Like, you guys have to dig deeper here. Uh, but after you hear something over and over again by... You know, we interviewed both poor folk and we interviewed community leaders and, and um, public servants and everyone was, was saying this nothing to do but drugs thing. And uh, we did then begin to collect information on how the social infrastructure of these places had just collapsed. Do you want to define uh, so it? social infrastructure, we all know what social capital is, right? It's social bonds that can help you get ahead. So, you know, we're in the same building here as Sob Break, so we all know <laughs> what social infrastructure is. Uh, social infrastructure are the places where you build social bonds, the library, the roller rink, the movie theater, the bowling alley. Uh, Bob Putnam famously has written about the decline of bowling leagues in the United States, uh, but in these towns, the bowling alley had simply closed down. And so we were able to go to several sources of data to try to validate this. Um, uh, several other scholars have done this as well. We went to the US Census of Businesses. And uh, we did find uh, that there was a, real, a, a very profound effect of this loss Do you think on opioid overdoses. That's right. Do you think we are, in a way, kind of trapped in our own mythology, then, about rural America? It, the mythology of rural America is community. Yeah. It's tight bonds. It's knowing your neighbor. It's looking out for each other. Um, so is that... Uh, and we're going to get to the advantage side of yeah. this eventually. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm curious... Well, I think in these communities, which are, you know, not all of rural America, the other thing that surprised us, we don't have, a, like, a separate chapter about this, but is the level of inequality in these places. Because coming from the outside, you might think, oh, it's a rural place, everybody's kind of the same. Like, 
I grew up in suburban California, but listening to Garrison Keillor, it was like, you know, of course, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all very similar, very homogenous. But in these places, there are, they, the, the, they are as unequal as some of the major cities in the U.S. So there's a few families that really own a lot of property and control a lot. And then there's a lot of people sort of at, at the bottom. And that economic divide is reflected a lot in social infrastructure. So, for example, um, one of my things I've studied in the past is religion. So people ask me, well, when you talk about this lack of social infrastructure, what about churches? What, what do churches do? And um, churches are complicated. I'm a pastor's son, so I, can, <laughs> I know from the inside. But um, so in, 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 there's lots of churches in Appalachia but not, I don't think any of the poor folks we talk to, they mm -hmm. never go to church. And they're like, oh, I would never be welcome there. You know, those, that's for the other folk in, in town. So there's a sense of exclusion from some of these things that's reflected, you know, basically a reflection of, of some of the class divide uh, in, the, in the town. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I want to go where Brett was just, Brent was just um, signaling a bit. Uh, to the places that place high on the index as well. Mm -hmm. Because one thing I guess we should point out is that we're looking at, you're looking at the places of deep disadvantage. They, they happen and tend to be rural, but that doesn't mean if you're rural, you're deeply disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about the places that you visited that were on the other end of the scale, that were of high advantage. Um, what were they like? And, and so I grew up in rural America, as we've talked about before, um, right in the belly button of the state, a little town called Minnesota, yeah. uh, in Minnesota, a little town called Staples. <laughs> and um, I've always vowed never to study rural America because because it was so it was a little dull growing <laughs> up there. Um, but you know, we had done a road trip right after COVID, visiting 175 of the 200 most disadvantaged counties in America, and it was transformative. I highly recommend it. We decided to do, uh, just before we had to deliver the book, a similar road trip to the most advantaged counties. And of course, they are all in the upper Midwest, so North and South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And uh, one thing that was really striking right away, and uh, I mean, Tim really brought the truth of what was going on home, is, you know, in, if you go down to South Texas, you see a farmstead and nothing but fields. Same with uh, the cotton belt, the tobacco belt. Um, but you get up to um, you know, the upper Midwest and you see a farm here, a farm here, a farm here, a farm here. Why would that be? So taking our lesson from doing the disadvantaged stuff, we started looking into the history of the settlement of these areas. And of course, um, these were all primarily settled after the Homestead Act of 1862. Of course, they, they couldn't pass the Homestead Act until the South seceded because the planters were opposed to giving people free land. <laughs> so, so when they seceded, they passed the Homestead Act. I mean, it wasn't all, you know, roses because there were Native uh, tribes living on these lands that were then expelled and, and forced out. But the nature of the Homestead Act was to spread land wealth fairly evenly across these places, um, which really set, you know, the tone for what is going on well, 150 what, years later. Yes, and what's remarkable is that these are places, so all of these mechanisms I just talked about, uh, the opposite is true for these places. They have the lowest number of children in private schools. They have the uh, lowest corruption in the country. Uh, they have the lowest rates of violence. Um, that you could go on and on. They're not rich places. They have very uh, low levels of inequality. Um, but uh, the health outcomes are tremendous. And, and the and intergenerational mobility mm -hmm. uh, is remarkable. Uh, now, you might say, well, they're mostly white places, um, we should acknowledge that migrant labor helps bring in those crops every year. Um, and, and that's, I think, now that that labor is coming from Mexico and other parts of the United States and not so much from South, from South Texas. But 
Uh, they're, um, they're just places that are, that, you know, it really do, <laughs> I grew up in, you know, a town that is a, approximately where Lake Wobegon was <laughs> supposed to be. And, and there is a, a, a sense that everybody is a little above average. So this, this social leveling, um, it, you know, people really thrive when, when, um, when uh, they grow up in these kinds of places. And so, so uh, I, didn't, I, I realize now that just because I was rural, I was not prepared at all uh, to study this part of rural America. And luckily, the people we encountered were very gracious. So I'm really curious. Um, I wrote a piece a couple of, or a year and a half ago about systemic disadvantage uh, and how um, we tend to we tend to think of disadvantage, disadvantage in racial or ethnic terms. You know, it's, and we all of our all of our policies are actually built toward addressing that kind of disadvantage. I'm curious, like many of these places that you're talking about are not predominantly minority. They are, in fact, uh, Caucasian-dominated areas of the country that have significant disadvantage. And I'm just wondering what you think, what's the policy implication of the fact that uh, we think of poverty as being a condition of minorities when it, in fact, affects the majority as well. What do you think the policy implications of that might be? So there are predominantly white uh, places of extreme disadvantage, especially central Appalachia, but also um, parts of Maine and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, for example. Um, you know, we, we haven't talked about Alaska, Hawaii. Those are unwritten chapters uh, that could well have been included in the book. So I, if there's anyone uh, from those days, I apologize <laughs> that we haven't mentioned them yet. Uh, but really, uh, uh, other than those areas, um, all of the areas of deepest disadvantage, every one of the counties, almost without exception, are majority minority. So, uh, and, and these, some people say, well, why don't we just write these places off? Tell people to move. This, a, a very prominent government official uh, said that to me recently. Uh, 60% of African Americans now live in the South. 40%, uh, 44%, I believe, of, of Hispanic Americans live in the four states bordering Mexico. Uh, and there are many of our poorest white children growing up in these regions as well. So uh, this affects a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the questions I've been thinking about is, is there a way to, uh, you're talking about leveling, how about level, leveling up the way that we think about poverty from the standpoint of you can be severely disadvantaged regardless of your race, mm -hmm. right? And really trying to think about this as disadvantage. Now, race is clearly an important, you can't argue with the math, you know, race is clearly a really important factor in disadvantage. Um, but one of the things that I've been thinking about, and this relates particularly to the, the problems of rural communities, is that there's actually ought to be a solidarity of interest there be, uh, across racial groups. Um, so, which we, absolutely, which yeah. you saw in the some of the labor movements we write about, um, both in in um, Appalachia, and there were uh, a, a significant uh, uh, representation of black miners. Um, but also in um, the Southern Tenants Farmers Union, which was a huge multiracial movement. There have been times in history, I was on Morning Joe and um, the Rev, you know, he, uh, he worked with Andrew Young when he was like 10 years old on some of the labor movements um, uh, in, among white and, and black tenant farmers in the South. So there have been those moments in our history where we've, we've seen We've seen people with shared economic interests um, supersede the social divides. So, I'm sorry, just one more follow-up question on this. Like, why is it, it what conclusion have you reached um, when it comes to uh, how people respond to this disadvantage? Um, you know, uh, uh, 
black communities have responded very differently than white communities of disadvantage have responded uh, in terms of their politics. You know, one, one has taken a pretty aggressive social intervention stance and the other has been, you know, kind of get government out of the way, uh, very much anti-government. What accounts for, and if you can say, what you think accounts for the differences in the responses? So I, I would not say that I know a lot about rural white America outside of these particular regions. And it might surprise the audience, but people really care about local politics mm -hmm. and they don't care very much about national politics. In That's the, not what I see on Twitter every day. Right. <laughs> so, right. So uh, I, we have, I have graduate students now doing, writing dissertations in small towns in North Carolina and and one studying other communities in the Delta. And, and I think the real story is that people are very disengaged mm. from politics across these regions. I did want to say something, though, about, about why another reason we shouldn't, uh, and, and this gets to your deeper question, I think, we shouldn't wash our hands of these places. Is there as a new group of leaders in town mm. in every location except Appalachia Right, they're a group of people who somehow. Well, they grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, went away, got credentialed, went to college, started businesses, but have really taken it as a mission to go back home and change things, the place that they grew up. And they've been really effective. The, some of those stories are in the, in the book. So, you know, the, 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 the people in town with the PhDs, they're black and brown people. Uh, mm -hmm. The people in town that are winning local elections and getting onto the school board, uh, they're black and brown people. And uh, so they're much more credentialed than the old money class. And they have experience in the wider world. They've worked outside of, of the region. And uh, I think uh, there's, uh, it's very hopeful mm. to meet these people. Um, Tamla Boyd Shaw, I can't help but mention from Greenwood, Mississippi, uh, became a leader in the charter movement nationally and came back and started a, a charter school in, in uh, LaFleur County. And, and you know, she, she and her, there's another woman, uh, Deborah Adams, who started a community center, came back from Memphis. Uh, Greenwood is her husband's hometown and they've resurrected this historic community center there on the south side of Greenwood. Uh, they started showing up at the Cotton Bowl which is a, um, a celebration of the white establishment. Cotton ball. Cotton, cotton ball. ball. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. That, yeah. <laughs> and um, soon they were bringing whole, whole tables uh, to, to the cotton ball. And, and really, you know, um, so there's new, new leadership and, and uh, investing in those leaders is incredible. There's also important. signs of hope, though. So thinking particularly about the South and the racial uh, divide there. So we, we interviewed a, uh, a city council person from Greenwood, Mississippi, a white uh, um, person who's, I think he's been in office for a while. But it, there was, he expressed some regret about how things had played out since the civil rights movement and said, you know, if we would have just made a different choice back then, we could have gone to each other's weddings, we would have allowed, you know, the schools to integrate. Maybe Greenwood and LaFleur County would be a really different place right now. Um, and so that was helpful to me to kind of say there's some sort of acknowledgement here that we took, we took the wrong road and we're really paying the price for that now. Well, it's really, um, it, it's, uh, really affirming to hear you talk about that sense of energy and change even happening uh, locally and a sense of hope. I mean, I think when we use the word disadvantage, we get this idea in our head of what that means. And, um, and I think it is interesting. I, I, I do think that is one thing that, that we need to shift our minds a little bit around rurals, that even in places of uh, persistent poverty or persistence of these dynamics over time, there are real people actually enacting real change in those places. Um, one of the things, that, just to pick up on before I ask my question, and then, and then I think we also want to go to the audience, is um, you talked about how people care about local politics. 
And one of your um, findings on the drivers is that loss of local, that social infrastructure. Well, local newspapers yeah. are a part of that local social infrastructure, which has actually made it harder, I think, for people to be engaged in the way they care about locally because they're not actually sharing information about what's going on, what's even happening locally. And there's that loss of accountability, which leads to some of the corruption that you were talking about as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, uh, nonprofit journalism in particular, um, I'm thinking of um, Alabama.com, Mississippi uh, Today, uh, ProPublica, the, Pro the Daily Yonder in the Appalachian region. This is where the investigative reporting is going on. This is how we know about Brett Favre is because of the reporting of Anna Wolf, uh, who won a Pulitzer for her coverage of this story. So uh, investing in local journalism, absolutely. Uh, it's an absolutely vital part of the solution. So let me ask a question. Like you were just talking about individuals who have come back and are, you know, creating momentum and leading change in those local places. To Brett's point, what about policy? What do we think? What do you think about the new place-based policy that we're focused on, where we have something like a recompete pilot program? We're going to make advance, you know, available twenty to fifty million dollars to, you know, either a local set of communities or or a small region. How? What's the from your perspective? What's the possibilities there to push against? the the systems and the history that you document so well in the book is that a fighting chance is that uh, what what what's your sense depends, of that depends on how it's done i think one of the lessons that we learned reading about uh, for example the war on poverty um in the 1960s and um i really understand now why johnson wanted to have maximum feasible participation <laughs> among the <laughs> The, the, Which Moynihan the called folks. maximum feasible misunderstanding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the intent and then how it worked out. Uh, but so I think one of the things that um, that you can do wrong is just send money to a local community, thinking that the leaders of that community are just going to do the best thing with it. it there, we've never written a book really with villains in it, but in this book, it's the local elite who capture almost everything that come in uh, to a community. Yeah, so, so to give an example, um, Laura Tak um, mm -hmm. and I was peripherally involved in this. We tracked every federal dollar going into uh, local communities over time. Um, first of all, much of this money doesn't even get to these places because they don't have enough grant writers to compete for them. Uh, but second, because they're bottom up, they're often driven by the local elites. And so the one county, uh, is it Tunica? Yeah. Tunica County, Mississippi, that has gotten more of these dollars per person than any other county in the country. Uh, we were trying to figure out, what did they do with the money? <laughs> it's something like $25,000 for every man, woman, and child in the county over this time period that Laura studies. And uh, they attracted a, a pipe factory to town that created a couple hundred low-wage jobs. Meanwhile... Uh, the local casino closed, leading to a job loss, 13,000. Hmm. So uh, we talk, I, I guess we, who, we've been talking to so many groups who care about rural America. It's very encouraging. Um, but th this importance of finding maybe the hometown heroes, you know, the hmm. people who have come back, the people who can, uh, who can break the mold of history, you know, the, the people running, uh, up until recently, the people running Manchester, Kentucky, was that exact family who started the big salt mines uh, based on uh, the labor of enslaved people in 1820 in that county. The same family. A lot of them went to prison. but uh. Yeah, but they've all ended up in prison now because yeah. they were buying votes and enabling drug dealers. But, hmm. but well, it is... Well, sorry, I didn't mean to catch you. I was just going to say, uh, uh, let's, let's open it up to our audience for some questions or, or comments from the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand. We've got the gentleman in the, in the back. And Thank please you state much. your name before you, uh, sure. before you ask your question. And just a reminder, but questions usually end in a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Matt Erskine, um, be curious, did you um, have uh, experience 
uh, with Appalachian Regional Commission or the Delta Regional Authority and uh, any perspective or thoughts on the work they're doing in those two regions. So any thoughts on the regional commissions, uh, the Appalachian Regional Commission or the Delta Regional Authority in those particular areas? So we do write about that in the conclusion. Um, I, I think the, the evidence hints at the fact that uh, they may, may actually, a lot of this money might be actually be profiting the local elites rather than the, the populace. Uh, you know, the Appalachian Regional Commission builds a lot of roads. That was a very big topic. Uh, and, and you can imagine the same people are getting the contracts for those uh, to, to complete that work and, and so on. Um, so, you know, the, the, this is not all we need to do to lift up these regions. We, we need, it's not we need targeted to do much, much more. as much as it, So the Delta Regional Commission includes parts of like 14 states or something. So it's, you know, it's, there's the part that's really the most disadvantaged, but then there's a lot of other people with their finger in the, in the pie as well. Yeah, and the scale of what uh, is even appropriated to, to ARC and DRA, comparatively speaking, I mean, Appalachian Regional Commission covers 14 states, DRA, you know, I think eight. Um, I got that. And, uh, yeah. and 175 million to the Appalachian Regional Commission on an annual basis seems to be modest, modest <laughs> comparatively yeah. speaking, to the index to to, yeah. to what your index shows is is happening there, and so so I, I think it raises a real question. Just, yeah, and just we had a preliminary conversation with several people who, including Bill Galson, who had studied kind of the history of. Uh, federal rural development policy dating back to, hmm. you know, uh, before the the New Deal, you know, just kind of looking at the variety of approaches hmm. and the, some of the efforts that were made to try to to boost rural America, to help rural America develop. And, uh, and I think the consensus was, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think the consensus was there's very little evidence that any of it had much effect. Do you, do you agree with that? Or we did look at the uh, at the, these data that Laura Talk put together, and um, uh, so far, not so good. So far, not so good. And again, um, you, well, I think it, it depends on what you're counting. Uh, I guess as like the mechanization of the South, I think, was um, spurred a lot by low interest loans to buy you know farm tractors. equipment and so on. So that was hugely transformative. Um, and so I guess it depends on what you're counting. And all yeah, I mean, I think I, the way that it kind of broke down was like some of these big changes like Tennessee Valley Authority or electrification or, you know, mechanization, mm -hmm. you know, um, those, of course, did have yeah. profound effects mm -hmm. in yeah. terms of uh, improving living standards and mm -hmm. raising up new industries and new opportunities. Um, but, but uh, and this goes to what Tony was talking about, you know, we've got these new place-based initiatives that the Biden administration is proposing. And I'm hoping, really, I, I sincerely hope that, that they defy the historical pattern and actually work. But the pattern is there. Like, very specific place-based interventions, we just don't have a lot of evidence that they move that needle. Um, for those communities, whereas, you know, anecdotally, at least in Tony's podcast, we hear about some green shoots coming based on kind of local leadership, uh, you know, it's coming from the bottom up uh, and seeing some transformations. So I don't know if you've got any reflections on that top down, bottom up sort of thinking about this. Well, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Our, our, this book, would not be interesting. We would not have learned hardly anything without uh, really hearing the voices of the people in these communities and, and spending time with them, going to the Bible study and the church potluck. And you, it, you know, if it was there, we attended. We were part of it. So um, that's very, very important. But um, because of this risk of elite capture, and the this Tim talked about the highly unequal class structures of these places. So you're not, you know, many of the folks on the wrong side of the tracks we talked to are not going to get to those meetings. 
I do, I, I, I'm kind of a top down after doing this research, um, but there has to be an appreciation of the bottom up too. So um, I'm wondering if we could use our, our rural extensions in some more creative way. Could we bring um, expertise uh, from from local universities and technical schools into these processes, um, what kind of technical assistance can we offer? How do, and maybe more fun, most fundamentally, how do we identify the new leadership and and how do we help that new leadership um, to grow and and, and to thrive? Um, so let's go back to the audience for questions. Um, uh, the woman here in the front. Thank you. Towards the front. Hi, my name is Karen Zugardi, and I have two questions completely different from one another. On one end, um, depopulation in rural America is a real thing, but one, one situation that I find interesting that I'm seeing in some communities in rural America is that we're, we're starting to see Latino population actually growing those numbers, and it's not only about immigration, but actually giving birth to kids and uh, populate in these communities. I'm curious about uh, if you guys have anything to say about that. And the other question is in regards, regards to policy innovation. Um, we find that in local communities, we, we see a lot of ordinances or uh, local policies that have been um, in the books for hundreds of years. And in regards to how we um, give land to people, access to capital from females and so forth. I wonder if you guys have any um, um, suggestions about policy innovations that people in economic development can um, support or provide. So the first question again was? Latinos, depopulation. Latino population. population. So as you know, um, in between 1940 and 1970, there was a great migration but there were actually five great migrations. Uh, they were from the very county places that we're writing about, right? Uh, blacks went north from the Cotton Belt, especially um, from these highly exploitative, there's a lot of push factor to get out of these places. Um, but, you know, 75% of, of Central Appalachia moved north, 75%. Uh, there was a program uh, that, in, you know, were, encouraged Native, uh, Native Americans to get, move to cities like Chicago and, and Minneapolis uh, during the 1960s. Uh, there was also a program to help Puerto Ricans do the same. And so it, American cities uh, during this period received very large numbers of folks uh, from these places. But since 1970, of course, you've seen return migration. Uh, so it's not just fertility. Fertility in the United States in general, you know, is is at historically low levels, but it's, it's people saying, I want to go, you know, th this is home. Uh, I think Northerners have a hard time getting their heads around this. Um, you know, the people we talked to in Marion County who were um, African American, this, you know, this was home. This was their place. Uh, and they had a right to be there and, and to claim it as a place uh, that they were, they were proud to be from. So, um, Yes, so there are areas that are seeing a growth or a stabilization of, of, of population. Um, it's, n it's mostly in southern cities, not too much in rural areas. And then the second question was... Policy innovation. Policy innovations. So one innovate, we, we, for each mechanism, we suggest a, a list of policies. And actually, we should have talked to these two before we... <laughs> <laughs> sent that to the publisher because it probably would have been better. Um, but let's take, so, so, so once you understand the mechanism, you can begin to imagine what you might do. So I'm thinking of social infrastructure. Yeah. And um, Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist at NYU, coined that term. And he wrote a lot about the power of the library. His book is called Palaces for the People, which is, of course, what Carnegie called uh, the library. Uh, but you can imagine, you know, there, there's all of these ways in which bowling alleys and, and, um, and movie theaters and arcades, and arcades yeah. found a lot of evidence that arcades were very positive in bringing the community together. Uh, the federal government, uh, we learned by, by statute, is usually prohibited 
from investing in those and those um, kinds of yeah. entities, um, call it, deeming it recreation. Uh, but certainly, uh, investing in the kinds of things that make community life sustainable and could stave off something as terrible and as costly as is the opioid epidemic is, is really worth thinking about. Many of our libraries are so underfunded, they have virtually no programs. Uh, we do fund the library, but at very low levels, there was a recent increase in the appropriation under the Biden administration, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to libraries' needs. So you can imagine all of these ways, both the government, maybe starting with libraries, but maybe eventually extending to some of these other recreation kinds of resources, and our nation's 2,000, we have 2,000, more than 2,000 foundations in the United States, could begin partnering together to take seriously the need in local communities. I was just thinking, um, I've been involved with the state of Oklahoma for a long time um, as, an, as an advisor, for, as you know, Brent, that's how we met each other. And uh, they're really standing up very innovative ideas in their rural communities for how to not only bring in jobs, but as you bring in jobs, uh, to also recreate the social infrastructure of these towns. So uh, I think that's a, a, just a little nugget that is so overlooked. Uh, so, I mean, my town has you know, is, um, lost its movie theater too. But the scale of the loss of social infrastructure in these places is just much greater. So I think that's really, um, it is, we're seeing more and more small towns as they're thinking about economic development. It's not just about necessarily um, attraction of a large employer coming in from the outside, but it's as much a focus on improving the quality of life, yeah. like that quality of life that people feel and and are able to participate in locally. And, uh, you know, some of the community leaders I've talked to, even in the Deep South, when I asked, you know, what's your economic strategy? They said, well, I'm not worried about my economic strategy. I want people to feel as if they can go to the park or that they can, you know, they have, our, our youth are active, they have hope, they have opportunity, they have things to do. When they feel proud, and we're all proud mm -hmm. to be in our town, the economics will happen. Like that's almost the mindset in which they were, you know, they, they kind of uh, articulated. Um, I'm going to go to an online question that we had uh, even before uh, we kicked off because it is also, uh, and, and Brent alluded to a little bit of this, but it is, it is also about rural and urban as a, as a package. Hmm. And we often think of a rural-urban divide now in our country um, and maybe even being pitted against one another uh, even economically, as, as you know, we are looking for where companies will, will cite and innovation. Any perspective from your, uh, from the work that you've been doing, both on the index, but also qualitatively in these places, where you see the, the economic challenges aligned between rural and urban, and, and you see a, a, a positive um, reinforcement there versus a disconnect. What, what would you say uh, about that? Well, I was thinking about, um, so I'm not sure this is positive, but uh, one thing I think that's underappreciated, and we mentioned it before, is that virtually everyone we met um, on the other side of the tracks um, in, mm. in these places had tried the North. Moved to Chicago. They moved to Chicago. Huh. Back. Yeah. So if there's a brilliant young economist at Princeton I would highly uh, recommend to you. Her name is Alora Duranencourt. It took me a long time to pronounce her name correctly. <laughs> uh, but she has written a paper called Can You Move to Opportunity? And she has amassed massive data showing that uh, for black Americans during the Great Migration, receiving communities literally reorganized in ways to become not places of opportunity but traps of despair. Hmm. So our cities uh, have, have uh, not been, you know, my grandfather came uh, from Sweden in 1918 uh, to Minneapolis. Uh, the kind of welcome 
Uh, he got as a Swedish immigrant uh, was very, very different than how cities have treated uh, especially black American migrants, but also to a lesser extent um, some of our other groups. Um, the, the reception of Appalachian migrants to cities uh, was, was, very, uh, was, was very poor as well, although they didn't suffer to the same extent that blacks did. So uh, these places have population transfers, and they've had them for a very long time. And, and many of the disadvantages you see were reinforced. Maybe one other thing is, is the way that the North financed the great, we call them internal colonies. Yeah, a lot of the South. money, um, the funds that actually financed the uh, exploitation of these places came from the North and from England and Scotland. Um, and so, uh, so a lot of the money didn't stay just with the local elites, but was going back to the banks and in the north and, and overseas and so on. So, so there is, it's, like, it's very interconnected. These are not so this is isolated what, places. Uh, what, were, what were the investments? In coal? In, or, um, um, especially in South Texas and developing the land down there, mm -hmm. cattle ranching, and, and later on agricultural development. Cotton. Cotton. Um, and obviously, Appalachia is famous for all of its outside investors coming in and, and naming coal towns after themselves. <laughs> so a lot of the profits went right out of these areas. And uh, the people who got rich were often as likely to be deeply in debt as they were to have money in the banks. So um, there was a sense in which the real pro people profiting from this all these arrangements were, um, were in the parts of the country that we absolve of these sins mm -hmm. when we talk about them. Uh, maybe one positive thing is that um, as young people, especially I'm thinking of South Texas, um, where there's only one school, everybody goes to it. There's such pride in the local school. Um, they have like the best marching band in the state. Marching bands are really big in this region. I see a, a head nodding in the <laughs> audience. But there is just a sense that education is the most important thing. Uh, the kids don't score very well. They struggle in college, but a lot of them go. And uh, most of the leaders in town now have been, were migrant laborers as kids and now have it's really advanced striking. degrees. When, when you but drive they go away through, to the city, and then they come back. When you drive through um, Crystal City and some of the command, so, so what's hanging off the street lamps in, in terms of banners are the local high school graduates and their pictures. Mm. You go to Appalachia, what's hanging off the street lamps are the veterans who died in a war. Right, so it's just a really striking, interesting. I'm not to make too much of it, but it's it was yeah. really striking to us to, to to see that. So the cities are really important because that's where you you retool. Uh, you know, many people don't come back; they stay in San Antonio, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. But many of the folks that do come back uh, did benefit from the amenities of the the the, the nearest city with with the opportunities. Jackson, Mississippi, uh, we could tell a similar story about people who have gone there. And, and it's rich array of HBCUs that can really take you all the way through a PhD. Well, let's go back to the audience. And the gentleman here uh, in the third row has been, has been patient. Yeah, right there. Thank you. It's actually a perfect time for my question now, because I wanted to bring us back to those kind of hometown heroes. I grew up on a small chicken farm in upstate New York. I went to a small liberal arts college in upstate New York, and I remember, like my freshman year, a professor asked us to raise our hands if we knew someone who had Lyme disease, and I was the only person in the class that raised my hand, and I realized for the rest of my time at school that being rural was all of a sudden like the most interesting thing about me when it had been <laughs> the most mundane thing about me for most of my life, and, you know, I wonder what kind of policy... Uh, policies you see to kind of promote the creation of those hometown heroes and the kind of mm. people to get them into school. My school had a scholarship for a student who grew up on a farm in upstate New York. It hadn't been given out to anyone in 20 years because there were no other candidates. But what other mm. sorts of policies do you see? Chicago just started their own uh, program to try to, you know, bring in more geographic diversity, and I think that's a great yeah. thing, but it's, uh, it's certainly just starting, so. Mm. Yeah, it, so we were just at Duke University, and they have really been great at 
at bringing in talented young people from all across the South. So we met all these students who grew up in the very places we were writing about. It was, it was really um, remarkable. And I did have an answer, but it slipped my... Well, uh, oh, yes. Um, so we tell this story about South Texas, where um, Anglos had been in control of everything for a long time. Even though it was 85%. 85% non-Anglo, non um, but in a series of um, civil rights moves, eventually uh, Hispanics um, won virtually every election. Uh, they, they swept the election, um, uh, but the mayor, whose, whose sister we actually interviewed. This was in the early 1960s. Yes, yeah, so it was a long time ago. The mayor had a fifth grade education, mm. and you know, they that they, they had learned about politics from the corrupt Angl Anglos, who, by the way, used the Texas Rangers to try to shut this election down. And so um, they did not govern very well. They really had a hard time. And uh, then uh, the, there was another, you know, then the Anglos got back into power. And, and then, then in the uh, late 1960s, there was another civil rights move. It's an amazing story. Uh, led uh, by a group of activists and some cheerleaders. At because the high school. At the yeah. high school, because cheerle there, was a, a, there was a quota where only a couple of cheerleaders could be Hispanic and everybody else had to be white. So the cheerleaders revolted and, and brought Ted Kennedy and Ralph Yarborough down. It was like a huge deal. And, and, and it changed, uh, it changed the neighbor, the, this revolt of civil rights in that in, in South Texas. So just an incredible um, story, but um, where was I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's so much fun to recount. So po first. policy innovations to, to support those hometown oh, heroes. Oh, yes, but they don't know how to, you know, it's like how do you teach people to lead? Now, I'm at a policy school, um, which was formerly run by your president here at Brookings, and I don't think we're really training those local leaders, the hometown mm, heroes. It's so federal focus. To it's, succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And you might imagine uh, that we could think of innovative ways. I, there are nonprofits out there. Um, I think one is called Run for Something. We write about these in the book that help train people to get elected. Uh, but what happens when they get elected? You know, where, where are they going to get the skills to lead? So again, um, one you know, educate, higher education is not necessarily a trusted partner in many of these places, uh, but the extensions are. So is there some way we can begin to cultivate the kinds of skills we're teaching our students in these elite policy schools in local areas? So I think that's a, it, it's a good challenge for policy schools to think about how they can support rural hometown heroes and maybe a bit of an embarrassment that we've <laughs> left that out. Well, it's also connected to, um, I think, one of the things, and you mentioned before um, the difficulty even with some of these governments, local governments, in accessing resources. Like, they don't have grant writers on stuff. And I think one of the things that um, we've been finding as we do our research is that the state of local governments, especially in these kinds of places, is uh, in some respects pretty dire. I mean, very, very constrained fiscally, um, don't have large tax bases, but also just fiscal constraints with prior loans or other things. Um, and there are always, you know, rural places. Many times it's volunteer elected officials. They have full-time jobs otherwise. Uh, and they are thinly staffed, you know, the 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 folks that they have are making sure that the public services they're responsible for um, are being delivered rather than being able to put a lot of thought into, you know, kind of the future mm -hmm. and where the town might go. Is that, does that ring, ring true yes. for you as very, well? Very much so. Very much so. So technical assistance um, is very important. During the last part of the, um, of the um, uh, Obama administration, uh, there was a really unique uh, approach to helping uh, four communities um, that had been particularly hit hard. 
And so um, the Pine Ridge uh, Native American Reservation was one. Baltimore, uh, where we live when we're not up at Princeton, uh, was another. And uh, what uh, Biden or what the, what the Obama administration did is they said for every um, for every entity, every cabinet official has to designate one person to be the champion uh, for Baltimore or for Pine Ridge or, or wherever it might be. And the idea was to offer them technical assistance to help them compete for the resources that other places were getting because they were simply so much more adept at, um, at competing for those funds. And so um, Baltimore um, got a lot more money than it otherwise would have. But I think it's, it's an interesting model uh, could we find a way, um, maybe at the state level, uh, hmm. to really support these rural regions by offering a rich, a rich tapestry of technical assistance from, from our elected officials? That's an interesting idea. I want to go to a, a question coming from online. So, Zoe, I'm going to turn to you so that you can be our, uh, our voice of those who are, uh, are watching us online. Yeah. Um, so this question comes from Dedrick A., and he's asking uh, what rural poverty teaches us about racial economic inequality and the racial wealth divide. Mm. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think it, it looks on the ground really different depending on which region we're talking about. So I immediately think of Greenwood and the Mississippi Delta. Um, so if you go to Greenwood, Mississippi, the north side above the river is very white. The south side below the river is predominantly African American. Um, and the two places just look completely different. You go to this, um, on the north side, there's a big boulevard with, you know, the old uh, live oak trees with the moss and these, you know, big houses and so on. And then on the south side, it's um, little shotgun shacks. And, and so the, the wealth divide is just immediately vi visible when you go through there. And then what happens in the south side, the big concern, um, and I'll loop this back to something you were talking about, Tony, um, is violence. It's an extremely violent place. And then residents of Greenwood, black residents of Greenwood say, I'm not even going to go to church picnics because someone's going to get into a beef and it's all going to go bad from there. Um, the people on the north side seem completely oblivious to this whole thing. In fact, the mayor, not to call anyone out particularly, but <laughs> when we went to talk to the mayor, we'd heard so much about violence in South Greenwood. We asked her, so what's your, what do you want to do? She just got reelected. Uh, what's your big idea for, and I think the lack of resources sometimes means that people scale down into such a small vision of, of what's possible Right? So she had nothing to say about violence, but she wanted to put in a fishing pier in the river uh, so that the fishermen would come and maybe have lunch at one of the, the downtown restaurants. Um, and so they're like living in two different worlds across the river from each other. And this goes, um, obviously this pattern goes uh, way, way back. So it's mostly, it's very stark in, in some of these areas, these, these wealth divides. And then just to build on that a little bit, um, so two, two newer papers by Alora de Renancourt uh, show that um, because blacks in particular were not able to benefit from moving north over the generations, or they were benefiting much less than they should have, um, this, of course, affects our persistent wealth gap between blacks and whites. So the, so the way the places reorganize themselves to constrain opportunity, whether you're in the North or the South, mm. has these long-term consequences for the racial wealth gap. Go to the um, gentleman in the back. Uh, has had his hand up for a while? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, you answered a lot of my question, Carl Polzer. I, it gets to migration. And, and whether, my, whether people benefit or not, they left. And it was probably the smartest, the most risk-taking, the least disabled people that left in the North. And that could be, I haven't heard that as a causal possibility. They, they, they left for generations, so that, that leaves the rest of the labor pool back in, you know, in these now disadvantaged areas. So the question, to what degree does that exacerbate the, 
the poverty. And I also was curious about the size of the the, peop, uh, the group of people coming back versus the size of the people that, that migrated out, mm-hmm. what the comparability mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's still more, you know, the, the population is still lower than it was. So not everybody's moving back. And a, and a lot of the return migration is um, elderly return migration mm-hmm. because it's a good place to retire and it feels like home. Uh, now that, you know, that could be a strength uh, elderly people volunteer more, and they're more involved in the community. They're, they're around to take care of grandkids and that kind of thing. Uh, but, it, you know, that's a complicated story, actually, um, about who left and, and what their uh, relative advantages were, uh, given the, the, the rest of the population. So um, we know that that, that that is true for um, black American migrants, that they were somewhat more advantaged, particularly the earlier cohorts. In the later cohorts, I think that story really changes. Um, I don't think we know uh, that story as well uh, for the Appalachian migration. Uh, For the South Texas migration, most people ended up in Milwaukee. And we don't know the story of whether they were the most or the least um, advantaged in that place. So, uh, you know, it's it's always shocking uh, for folks who are not social scientists to realize that social scientists haven't studied some of the most basic questions. But uh, unless I'm wrong, um, it's not a, a given that it's always the, uh, the top talent. We know that from international migration as well. My, my grandfather had only a fifth grade education. He was a, from a family of landless peasants. So I think it depends. And uh, we need to know more to really untangle that story. Well, we're coming toward uh, uh, toward the end of our time. I want to go back online to see if we've got a, a, a question um, from our online viewers. And then I also want to give both of you a, a chance to, to offer some closing thoughts as well. Um. Yes. Um, sorry, what was their name? Raphael H. is asking about housing. Um, He wants you to discuss affordable housing issues in rural versus urban areas. Uh, So about housing development in small towns and and the differences there. Well, I'll say one thing, and then maybe you can think of a better answer. (laughs) Um, So one thing people said is, you know, why didn't you use the supplementary poverty measure? Of course, we can't because we don't have it for small areas. But what about housing costs? You know, is this the right map? What about housing costs? But we find in these areas that there, the, uh, the, there, there are as many people that are, have severe rent burdens as in, as in m- many of our cities. So it is not obvious that, um, that, that people in these areas are not suffering from housing burden. Many, in many communities, they're suffering from severe housing burden. The quality of the housing That's is... That's what I was going to say. I've never seen, though, driving through some towns in Texas, it was just amazing to me that people actually lived in these, some of these structures. It was, I'd never seen anything in this country, in any urban area, no matter how bad. Kathy and I used to live in Camden, New Jersey in the 90s and other places, but I'd, I'd never seen that kind of, of housing um, dilapidation that was actually inhabited. Um, so it, is, it's, it was really striking. And then the fact that, yeah, these places aren't really that cheap <laughs> as you would expect them to be. Yeah, and, you know, when we, um, we, we were in Marion County that suffered from these back-to-back extreme weather events, uh, hurricanes, and historic flooding, um, this was very revealing mm. of ways in which inequality in housing can affect disaster relief. So... Uh, Many black Americans did not have the money to raise their homes sufficient to take care of, uh, to take advantage of federal monies, uh, or their homes were simply deemed worthless. Uh, they had great use value to the people who were living in them, but um, they had no resale value. So, so it is often in the context of housing that you see, um, you know, these inequalities actually maximize. Um, you know, when, when the federal government comes to town and tries to help people cope with, with a natural disaster. The other so issue, th- the policy, uh, which I think FEMA has changed now, but a lot of the areas, the black 
land in the south, and some of the white uh, land in Appalachia are all heirs property. In other words, there's no formal title that's passed along. And you can't get help without formal title. And so and that's a really long, complicated process. Um, they're starting to recognize that that is a real issue in, in a lot of these areas that are most prone to, to mm -hmm. these kind of disasters. So, Well, having done a lot of work after Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana and Mississippi, yeah. it was one of the most difficult uh, things for people to be able to access the public funds for their ability to kind of yeah. make their homesteads whole again. Um, it, was, it was very difficult. But that, that unhappy intersection sometimes between housing, housing burden, um, wealth, and inequality uh, can be quite stark in some of the places that, that come up high on your index of, of deep disadvantage. Luckily, uh, some of these places do have quite a bit of public housing. Uh, now, it's interesting how this housing is sited, right, on the edge of town, on the periphery uh, of town. Um, East northern stories have, northern cities have their own stories of public housing siting that aren't, aren't pretty, but um, uh, many of these places have, over the years, um, acquired some public housing and elderly housing. Well, I want to give each of you um, a chance just to offer some closing thoughts. I mean, you came to this based on the data, right? right? You started to look at places, and the places, like you said, you, you switched from looking at poverty amongst people to poverty in places. Uh, and it turned out that many of those places were rural and also clustered together in significant areas. Uh, so, what this is a journey you've been on. Tell us where. What are your final thoughts on this journey? And also, as we think about sort of policy around this, um, I don't know. It would just be good to to. What What do you see? Some of the big lessons coming out of it for yourself and and your own work, uh, not having been situated on this before. Well, you know, one of the things, one of the realizations that we had as we were doing this work is when we looked at the map, we said, oh, wait, this is not a surprise. These were the very places that gave the war on poverty its face, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Lyndon Johnson taught in the Winter Garden when he was 18 years old because he had to earn some money uh, to go back to school. And this experience of teaching in a in a Mexican American school just was seared on his con uh, on his consciousness and really shaped his policy making going forward. Hmm. So, uh, I think if we don't do something along the scale of a, um, the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe, you know, something big, not the ARC or the Delta Regional Commission, but something uh, a response that's uh, that that is responsive to the scale of, of this problem, we'll be looking at the same map uh, 60 to 70 years into the future. And so uh, how do you get people to care about rural America? It's hard. <laughs> we know this. Uh, we were talking about this last week, Tony. Um, but if we don't care about it, uh, we're foolish because it's shaping our, our national politics. Um, it's shaping our health profiles. It's shaping epidemics. Uh, like the like the opioid um, ep epidemic, all of this is due to our uh, ne not so benign neglect of these areas. Hmm. Well, it was very. I think the the personal experience of of going to these communities. There's no substitute of, um, and I don't know how to to scale this up or or what to do about it. Um, but going to the Mississippi Delta to the, to the first time that haunted me for months just being there. And I'd, you know, been a lot of different places. But but somehow getting people to ne to go beyond their sort of um, preconceived ideas about what these places are like and actually being introduced to the places, the people, the just the physical landscape. Um, I don't know how we do that, but mm -hmm. maybe some urban rural exchange program or Freedom something. Freedom Summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, freedom. Uh, Doug was. McAdam and from Stanford, sociologist Stanford, wrote about the people who uh, actually went to Freedom Summer, which is, of course, located in Greenwood, Mississippi, uh, versus, uh, in other places, versus uh, the people who were biographically available. But no, they were accepted to the program, but couldn't go I for couldn't some go. reason. Yeah. 
and found that this experience transformed their lives. So relatively to those who missed out on this opportunity, their careers were different. They married different people. They, yeah, it was a number of different trajectories. Uh, based, and that was a pretty intense experience of Mississippi in 1964, where Schroener, Cheney, and Goodman were killed in that whole environment. But, uh, but well, well, I do think that you know, building back the relationships between those who live in, in rural places, whether they be of deep disadvantage or even advantage, mm -hmm. uh, and those who are living in metropolitans, and uh, more and more we have uh, more population in the U.S. Uh, living in metropolitan areas, would be not only beneficial to rural places, mm -hmm. uh, but would be beneficial to the country. And so that is something that I think we need to keep think, putting our heads uh, around. Um, and we've come to the end of our time, so I just want to offer my own deep appreciation, Brent, for you, for, for this journey that we're taking together. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, yeah. uh, and Kathy and Tim for being with us today. And to all of you for, uh, for being attentive and being here, uh, both in the audience in person and online. And we'll see you next time, uh, March 14th, uh, on the front porch. Uh, thanks very much. All right.